Hi, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Gilliland Rams. I am a longtime Jane Austen fan, the author of the Austen University Mysteries series, and I wrote my dissertation on Jane Austen adaptations. And today we need to talk about something from Pride and Prejudice. One second. In a novel that is notorious for being perfectly constructed with no loose threads and no extraneous details, one sequence has always stood out to me as being incredibly strange. In volume two, chapter 16, Jane and Elizabeth have just returned from their travels. Lizzie has just come back from her trip to visit the newly married Miss Charlotte and Mr. Collins, and Jane has been staying in London with Mr. and Mrs. Gardner. Lydia and Kitty meet them in town to have lunch, and Lydia recounts the following story of what she's gotten up to while her older sisters were gone. Dear me, we had such a good piece of fun the other day at Colonel Forster's. Kitty and me were to spend the day there, and Mrs. Forster promised to have a little dance in the evening. By the by, Mrs. Forster and me are such friends. And so she asked the two Harringtons to come, but Harriet was ill, and so Penn was forced to come by herself. And then what do you think we did? We dressed up Chamberlain in woman's clothes on purpose to pass for a lady. Only think what fun. Not a soul knew of it, but Colonel and Mrs. Forster and Kitty and me, except my aunt, for we were forced to borrow one of her gowns and you cannot imagine how well he looked. When Denny and Wickham and Pratt and two or three more of the men came in, they did not know him in the least. Lord, how I laughed and so did Mrs. Forster. I thought I should have died. And that made the men suspect something, and then they soon found out what was the matter. This moment comes at the tail end of a long monologue from Lydia, so it can be easy to miss in a reading of Pride and Prejudice. But just to be clear, Lydia has just told a story about dressing up a man as a woman. Chamberlain, an officer in the Hertfordshire militia, is coerced into wearing one of Mrs. Phillips' dresses on purpose to pass for a lady as part of a joke on the other soldiers. Now, if the story had ended there, we might be tempted to see this anecdote as simply further proof of Lydia's lack of decorum. What I find telling, however, is that Austin follows this with Lydia explaining that their deceit was a success. You cannot imagine how well he looked. When Denny and Wickham and Pratt and two or three more of the men came in, they did not know him in the least. This is a weird moment, no? Lydia's character is already well established at this point. We understand that she is the wild Bennett sister, the one most likely to do something to besmirch her family name. We don't need a whole lot more evidence to be convinced at this point in the story. So why does Austin choose to give us this fairly detailed anecdote about Chamberlain being dressed up as a woman and passing for a woman in the midst of everything else going on in the novel? I don't think it's a coincidence that this moment is hidden in the long monologue given by Lydia that foreshadows other more important events to come in the story her continued interactions with Wickham, her friendship with Mrs. Forster, the trip she will soon be taking to Brighton, and the lack of sense that will almost have catastrophic consequences for the Bennett family. I believe Austin does this intentionally and that she slipped this random story in, trying to make it seem almost like an afterthought, when in fact, it's a hint at one of the central conceits of the entire novel. From the very first line of Pride and Prejudice, Austin subtly lets us know that she's not going to be playing by the rules with this book. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a fortune must be in want of a wife. As one of the most iconic opening lines in literature, this quote has been dissected by many Austin fans, scholars, and critics. Stella Butler writes that this universally acknowledged topic of discussion is a sort of social leveler, which brings Darcy's relatives and Elizabeth's Lady Catherine de Bourgh and Mrs. Bennet unexpectedly together in their shared obsession over marriage. Thomas Keemer calls the opening sentence the satirical invocation of a communal voice. William Galperin breaks down the first line as the coercive weight of public opinion that becomes conflated with the wish-fulfilling fantasies of women. These analyses all point to the novel being a feminized text in which the concerns, interests, and yes, even fantasies of a community of women are brought to the forefront. And what exactly are those womanly concerns, interests, and fantasies? In Pride and Prejudice, it's finding a husband. Not exactly a revolutionary idea since the marriage plot is one of the most popular plots in fiction. And this was true even in Austen's time. What is more revolutionary is that in Austen's novel, the priority wasn't just on finding any husband, it's on finding the right husband. And this is a process that the women characters have the most say in deciding. 
This might seem like a small distinction, but it subtly points to the character dynamics and gender norms of the novels in Austen's time. By slightly shifting these roles, Austen allows for the possibility, however subtle, that the most important voice in determining a woman's future should be her own. Don't be fooled by Mr. Collins and Mr. Darcy proposing right and left. As it soon becomes clear as the novel progresses, these men are not the ones calling the shots. Who are the real power players in Pride and Prejudice? Elizabeth Bennet turns down multiple proposals, nabs the richest man in town. Mrs. Bennet sets out to marry one of her daughters, by the end of the book ends up marrying off three, and Lady Catherine, the richest, most powerful person in the whole book. Even women characters who on the surface might not hold as much power are shown to be significantly more volitional than their male counterparts. I could point to any number of examples, but let's look at Miss Bingley, who I believe is often unfairly undervalued as a power player in Pride and Prejudice. We know that Miss Caroline Bingley is Meddlesome's sister to Charles Bingley and the would-be love interest of Mr. Darcy. Though on the surface it might seem like Miss Bingley defers to these two men, don't be tricked by Austen's sleight of hand. If you look at the language of the text closely, you'll see that Miss Bingley wields a lot of power. Take for instance, volume one, chapter four. Mr. Bingley has made it known that he has an interest in Jane Bennett and Mr. Darcy gives only a begrudging endorsement. Miss Bennett he acknowledged to be pretty, but she smiled too much. Often when we think of the relationship between Bingley and Darcy, we think of Bingley deferring to Darcy's opinion, but there are other people who ultimately hold more sway namely his sisters, Mrs. Hurst and Caroline. Let's look closely at the following response to Darcy's half compliment, half criticism of Jane. Mrs. Hurst and her sister allowed it to be so, but still they admired her and liked her and pronounced her to be a sweet girl and one whom they should not object to know more of. Miss Bennet was therefore established as a sweet girl and their brother felt authorized by such commendation to think of her as he chose. So whose opinion matters here to Bingley? It's not Mr. Darcy. As soon as Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley give Jane their approval, she becomes established as a sweet girl. Their take on Jane is held as the authority, and Austin makes sure we understand this by following up with telling us that Bingley feels authorized by their commendation. In fact, Darcy's opinion only holds any sway because Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley allow it to be so. Mr. Bingley is a rich single dude living his best life in Regency England, and he needs his sister's approval to even think about pursuing something with the woman he likes. That's some serious power, and it tells us something about the dynamics Austin is building in this text. The shift in power dynamics is not overt, and it's not in your face. It's a subtle tilt, often hidden in plain sight, and you have to look carefully to find it. If women are the volitional characters in this novel, what is it they are vying for? By and large, it's the men folk. In fact, most of the focus of the book is our universal womanhood comparing and contrasting the men characters. Remember, it's not just about finding a husband, it's about finding the right husband. You gotta shop around first and see what your options are. First, we get to see a comparison between Darcy and Bingley, the first two eligible single men of property who enter the narrative. In understanding Darcy was the superior. Bingley was by no means deficient, but Darcy was clever. He was at the same time haughty, reserved, and fastidious, and his manners, though well-bred, were not inviting. In that respect, his friend had greatly the advantage. Bingley was sure of being liked wherever he appeared. Darcy was continually giving offense. Right off the bat, we see this novel is primarily going to be sifting through these men, trying to decipher who is the most valuable object of desire. In other novels written in that time, that focus would have usually been reserved for the women characters, descriptor upon descriptor of the heroine's beauty, her kindness, her bravery, her moral fortitude, to prove why she is the ultimate choice for a wife. The men in these books, honestly, aren't often all that much to get excited about. Let's just say there's a reason why we don't have giant statues of Valancourt, Mortimer, or Mr. B making their way around the globe, but they don't have to be. These men are the subjects, not the objects of desire in their respective books. In Pride and Prejudice, Austen lets us know right off the bat that she's flipping the script. As much as we all love Elizabeth Bennet, Austen lets us know she isn't the prettiest Bennet sister, she isn't the nicest, and though she has her admirable qualities, she still has some learning and growing to do. Rather than putting us off our heroine, this actually makes us relate to her more. The heroine doesn't have to be perfect or angelic or dramatic to hold our attention, and we can experience the story with her because she isn't on a pedestal, a perfect prize to be won. 
Lizzie isn't the prize in Pride and Prejudice. Darcy is. And even though it takes some time for Lizzie and us by extension as the readers to learn this, the focus of the book is to guide us toward that conclusion. Elizabeth is our subject, the character we experience the events of the novel with, and Darcy is, as she explains to her father, the object of her choice. Darcy is the right man, and that is her choice, ultimately. Not Darcy's, not Mrs. Bennet's, not Catherine de Bourgh's. That's why basically every other single male in the novel is compared to Darcy at some point. For instance, Mrs. Gardner compares the portraits of Wickham and Darcy at Pemberley, deeming Darcy as not so handsome as Wickham, though his features are perfectly good. As the novel progresses, however, these comparisons become less and less favorable to the other men. We come to understand Bingley's lack of conviction, Colonel Fitzwilliam's lack of romance, and Wickham's lack of conscience. Not to mention Collins's lack of everything. Darcy emerges as the clear prize, the ultimate object of desire. And this is not decided by the opinions of the other men around him, but by the women characters in his circumference. Even Mrs. Bennet, who isn't a huge fan of Darcy in the beginning of the book, is won around to Darcy by the end, giving him a ringing endorsement in the novel's denouement and reminding the reader of his many varied attractions. Good gracious, Lord bless me, only think, dear me, Mr. Darcy, who would have thought it? And is it really true? Oh, my sweetest Lizzie, how rich and great you will be. What pin money, what jewels, what carriages you will have. I am so pleased, so happy. Such a charming man, so handsome, so tall. Oh, my dear Lizzie, a house in town, everything that is charming, 10,000 a year. In a sea of eligible young men, Darcy emerges as the novel's clear object of desire. So much so that he continues to shape the way that romance novels and period dramas prioritize the female gaze, with men as the objects of the heroine's desire, the ultimate prize to be won. And conversely, in the heteronormative cisgender marriage plot that many romances still follow today, if the hero is the object, then the heroine gets to be the subject. We get to experience the events of the story through her perspective and get to celebrate her right to choose her own happy ending. So how is all of this connected to the scene where Lydia tells us about dressing up, in Chamberlain, or dressing up Chamberlain in women's clothes? Taken out of context, this moment is a weird blurb in an otherwise meticulous novel. Taken in the context of what Austen sets about to do in Pride and Prejudice, it starts to make a lot more sense. One of Austen's goals in Pride and Prejudice is to subvert the usual gender norms readers would have expected from novels of the time. The heroine is not the object of desire in the novel, rather the hero. Yes, Lizzie receives a lot of attention from the main characters in the book, but notably it's only Darcy who's really interested. Mr. Collins proposes yes, but only because he thinks Jane is going to get engaged to somebody else. Wickham is vaguely interested, but then ditches her for Miss King and ends up running off with her sister. Colonel Fitzwilliam lets her know upfront that she's not rich enough to tempt him. Instead of men fighting over the right to take the heroine's hand, we see the women fighting to decide who gets to marry Darcy. Miss Bingley does everything in her power to try to get Darcy's attention, including walking around the room, the pre-Instagram thirst trap. The final obstacle in the love story is not another male rival showing up to try to separate the two lovers, but Darcy's aunt trying to throw around her weight and get Lizzie to back off. Darcy is the prize and Lizzie is heroine of the novel in part because she's the one who ultimately wins him. All of this is done so subtly that you might not notice it unless you're really paying attention. And that's where we see Austin being a little bit cheeky by including this scene with Lydia and Chamberlain, in which a man is paraded around in women's clothes, turned by the women into their plaything to do with as they will. She's teasing us with this obvious example of gender subversion, rubbing it in our faces while also expertly hiding it among so many other details that it can get lost. This all fits into Austin's usual strategy of pushing societal norms just far enough to make her commentary, but still give herself plausible deniability which is sneaky. Claudia Johnson comments on this in her collection of essays, Jane Austen, Women, Politics, and the Novel, writing, Austen's manifestly self-conscious achievement in Elizabeth Bennet thus consists precisely in having made her creature so delightful, despite her continual infractions of the rules of propriety. Lydia's offending presence in the novel makes this possible. Lydia is a decoy who attracts the disapproval to which Elizabeth herself could otherwise be subject. And by lamenting Lydia's glaring excesses, Elizabeth is cleared for her less egregious but still improper rambles, conceit, and impertinence without arousing our discomfort or incurring our censure. 
Austin is knowingly pushing the boundaries with Elizabeth's character, but Johnson argues that she gets away with it by distracting us with Lydia's even more outrageous behavior. In the Chamberlain anecdote, we see Austin using a reverse strategy, using the familiar tropes of the marriage plot to tell a radical story, or in other words, using a too light, bright, and sparkling love story to distract us from how she's inverting traditional gender roles and power structures with her characters. Only it seems like she can't quite help herself by teasing us with the obvious thing hiding right underneath our noses, as we see in this story with Chamberlain. In Lydia's anecdote, it's the fact that she can't keep from laughing that clues the men into the fact that there's a trick being played on them. Much in the same manner, it's the way that Austin can't keep from including this little inside joke that lets us know she's been playing a trick on us all along, if only we look carefully. Thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to reading your comments and seeing what questions you have there. Thank you so much.